the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I forgot to announce where Ben was. He's uh, not sick or the coronavirus hasn't zapped him. He is skiing with the youth group. And I'm here. So everything's well. One of the most counterintuitive, strange juxtaposition of words in Holy Scripture, I think, is my text today. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Another way of paraphrasing this. Jesus was determined to have a retreat before his public ministry. His spiritual director was the Holy Spirit who partnered with Satan. <laughs> and here we go. Remember, when old man Gulick stands before you, he stands with you. The only person I really preach to every week is myself. And so if anything in this sermon connects, it's because our humanity, mine and yours, is one humanity together. The year 2005 was my wilderness year. I had surrendered to my ego, which sometimes is the voice of the tempter, and accepted the nomination for presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, even though I never, ever had any internal resonance with that possibility. If, and by the way, if there's one word text today, it's if. If, it's a horrible word. If I had not entered into that process, I would have been able to engage a search with a seminary that was looking for a bishop dean. I love the formation of younger people for ministry. That would have been my joy. I had tremendous resonance with that. And there was another diocese that I knew well that was looking for a bishop. I had served Kentucky 15 years. I think I could have brought gifts to that diocese if I hadn't been ego attached to a possibility that wasn't best for me. So I got some ifs. Maybe you have some ifs. My hunch is that I'm not the only person in church today haunted by the pesky persistent, life-sapping, niggling word, if. If I had studied harder. If I had swallowed those harsh words instead of spitting them out. If I had not had that second drink. I had returned her phone call. If I had not gone to Vegas. <laughs> if I had made her go to the doctor sooner. As we hear the story of the spirits, the Holy Spirit, the calling spirit, the beckoning spirit, as we hear the story of the spirit's strange method of calling forth and answering love from Jesus and choosing, the Holy Spirit's choosing of Satan as a retreat partner, we learn as we look at this odd story that Satan has a particularly sharp piercing arrow in Satan's quiver. And that piercing arrow is the word if. If you are the Son of God. If. 
in Jesus' retreat on his desert honeymoon, because you see in the Bible, deserts are always honeymoons between God and God's people. As he's in his retreat, as his ministry is about to begin, the Holy Spirit prompts Jesus to remember Moses' desert sermon to the children of the Exodus on their honeymoon in the desert where they were actually screwed up over and over again. Every answer that Jesus gives in his retreat to Satan is part of Moses' sermon to the Israelites when they were in the desert on their retreat after having been liberated from Egypt. That sermon that Moses gave can be summarized. Because God has delivered you, because God has made you God's people, because God does not and cannot forget you even when you get seduced by golden idols, then love, trust, and obey the God who has made you whose you are. That's the sermon that Moses gave. And that's the sermon that Jesus was reflecting on in his retreat. You see, it was Jesus claiming of his inner because, capital B. Jesus claimed his inner because, and that allowed him to res resist those compelling ifs. The way, you, the way you get rid of if is with a capital B, the cause. The catalyst's attempt to distract him was with that horrid word, if. But if you ever study Matthew's gospel, one of the most amazing things is two verses before the story of the temptation, we have the culmination of Jesus' baptismal moment in the Jordan, and the heavens were opened, and the voice said, you are my beloved, and I am so pleased with you, and the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. That's the way Matthew reads. And on this retreat, I would posit that the whole retreat was about getting rid of the ifs and claiming the because you are the beloved. That's what the journey was about. Jesus remembered the consuming fact that he was loved. And that memory, because he was loved, became a shield that defended him from the arrow, the piercing arrow called if. The shield that defends us from that piercing arrow is because God loves us, period. If we're honest, in this mutual honeymoon with God, that we call Holy Lent. This honeymoon that we're entering into today demands that we be honest, that we must face the arrows of our own haunting ifs and drown them, and drown them, drown those ifs in the water of our baptism, where at that moment the heavens were opened and a voice said, in paraphrase, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. We must drown all of the ifs of our existence in that holy because we are marked as Christ's own forever. The ifs have no lasting power as sticky as they can be over us. That if we allow them to be drowned in the larger truth of our baptism, the way the pursuing Egyptians who were trying to recapture Israel were drowned in the waters of the Red Sea. 
our ifs must be drowned. Because, because we float in the ocean of God's love at every moment of our existence. Keep the sermon short this week. I just pray that this Holy Lent will be a season of the Spirit annihilating of all of your pesky ifs. I want them all to be annihilated. God wants them all to be annihilated. And I want them to be drowned in the vast ocean of God's because. Because he loves us. Because you and I will relearn this 40 days that God in Christ Jesus, despite the truth of all the ifs, they're drowned. The nightmare is over and we can, and we can breathe because because Jesus loves us to death.